Without further ado, I want to call on stage Vodafone and Ben Emma. Please join us. Emma is head of content, group content at uh, Vodafone, VPC based in Luxembourg. Big applause for Emma. <laughs> Wherever you want. Hi. Nice to meet you. And Ben, independent analyst and advisor. So the two are going to talk about what's going on in content and TV at Vodafone, what's important to know, lots of recent announcements. So enjoy, stage is yours. Thank you, welcome Emma. Thank you Ben, thank you Andy. So look, we all know TV is a pretty challenging business, right? It gets harder and harder to really make a success of it. Makes it harder and harder to be in the events business when you're destroying the podium as you take it away. <laughs> uh, now, in, in, in the words of this session, why stay on board, Emma? Why stay on board? Why is it worthwhile for Vodafone to be in the TV business? Well, we've got 18 million TV customers, so it would be a bit of a mission to tell them all that we're not doing it anymore, number one. <laughs> um, and I just think it's it's a reflection, right, of how people um, do it and want to consume through through a telco or a TV company, however you want to describe us. But there's 18 million, and um, they value us greatly, and, and there's a point to being there. We do actually um, make money through being in the content business as well, if you consider the holistic view and don't slice up the P&Ls too much. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a good reason for it. So you, you're in, what, nine markets? Yeah, nine uh, markets. And, you know, 18 million gives you a pretty sizable uh, subscriber base, relatively speaking. In Europe, you're one of the leaders. Yeah, we are, for sure. And um, it's not easy being there. It's not easy to retain that position. So it was interesting to see what Tim had to say there about retention. It's very different in the pay TV bundling space than it is in D2C. But I think we we make great kind of partnerships with some of these guys. Um, and we know that the D2C strategy, um, you know, it's difficult to compete against, but we bring something different, right? So we can, we can bundle in and make those customers stay with the Netflixes, the Amazon Primes, the Disneys for much, much longer than were they just D2C. So is it is it all now just about being the best aggregator of streaming apps, or do you require a deeper level of content aggregation to offer your customers better, superior discovery, navigation experience? Yeah, I think that's it now, Ben. I mean, we can go out and do deals with everyone, and we do. We've got you know the usual suspects in the OTT space. We have seventeen hundred linear channels. Um, so we, we've got everything, but it's not necessarily the recipe for, for making it work. You have to provide that aggregation service, the search, the surfacing, the promotion. That's a constant challenge for us to, to stay front of mind and to give customers what they want and serve it up to them and make it easy for them and not make it too expensive. So that, that sounds like price is a key element here, that economic bundling. Is that, do you think still one of the key elements of your, your competitive uh, dynamic? It definitely is, for sure, and um, it's getting harder. So the D2T, D2C strategies with all the, um, the OTT guys um, trying to do wholesale deals with them every day of the week, you know, they need to make money, they need to pay for these terrific shows that they produce, and they need to pass the pricing on. So it's very difficult to get a competitive rate and to bundle that in with all the other costs that we have. And for the first time, certainly in my career, quite a long time, 20 years plus doing linear channel deals, and inflation is a, is a very real thing for us in content costs now. Um, this is the first time I've seen it in, in deal negotiation as a, as a major point, you know? So it's, um, you're trying to build these bundles, these cost-effective competitive bundles, but you've got all these new factions coming in, so fantastic content, but very expensive content and all the other things that you need to pay for as a, as a delivery mechanism. I, I just want to make sure I understand that, Emma. You're, you're saying this is the first time you've seen content owners want more for their content. <laughs> Using inflation as the excuse. Ah. So <laughs> you, you don't mind paying for the new stuff, right? You know that costs money, but um, 
and you, you find it, you've always found it quite easy to negotiate against someone who's selling you only fools and horses for the 30th time. You say, well, you've actually paid for it now. Um, but with the inflation arguments, with the new content, there's real cost increases, right? And we know, I mean, I shouldn't say maybe people don't work for minimum wage necessarily, but we know there are you know, energy costs and other very, very important costs that are, are real to the producers. So you can't say inflation doesn't affect TV production because it absolutely does, and that has to be passed on. So that's the new, new sort of negotiation lead, is it? That, mm. that you know... We're good at pushing uh, back ask, on it. Ask poor <laughs> content owners, look, look, we have to spend all this extra money... Yeah, I think, well, I've worked on both sides, right? So um, it's it's hard to argue against things that you've been arguing for for a long time. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, well, personally, I don't think it's, it's cost of living factors driving up cost of production. I think it's other factors driving up those budget costs, com competition for, yep. for, for the right projects, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that's another discussion. So you mentioned that... Um, Linear channels uh, are still a pretty important part of your your offering. Most of us have heard a lot of hype about so-called fast channels. Mm. Excited about those, Emma? Um, super excited, and we are trialling some fast channels, and we will we will be launching lots of fast channels. But I'm trying to normalise the conversation internally because we see this. You know, on LinkedIn every other day, fast channel this, fast channel that, brilliant, good. There's real value in it, and and it's important. And we've seen lots of success stories. But I think as a super aggregator, as we like to call ourselves, you know, we're launching channels every day of the week, be that pay TV, PSB, free to airs, whatever they are. And I think fast is just another way of delivering linear channels, and um, they are important. The, the the revenue speaks for itself, the stories we see in the press. But I think we need to normalize it. It's just content. They're just linear channels. Um, I think the OTT guys are much, much more important. Well, I mean, what's, what's the differentiation <laughs> for you then? What, what marks out the fast from the rest of the linear universe? It's just the means of delivery, right? And I, I guess, as a platform, there's scope for monetization that we haven't had before. So I think we can't ignore that. That's very important, and we have to get on board with it. I like the fact that it's niche. I think as a super aggregator, you have a duty not just to carry the Netflixes and the Amazon Primes and all the rest of it. You have to carry the foreign language content and some of the niche stuff. And that's when a super aggregator like us, we can really serve best because we, we can put everything in one place. So what, what's your timetable for rollouts for fast? When, when will it happen? How many of my suppliers are in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Soon. I think we're trialing a couple of channels now in Spain and Portugal. And yeah, this year for sure. Yeah. Spain and Portugal always seem to be kind of interesting you know, innovation markets for you. Is that right? Yeah. The Portuguese team are... Fantastic, and I think it's because our tech team is largely based in Portugal. I think they get everything first, um, but yeah, they're they're really flying and doing well there. Yeah. So, um, getting content deals is what you're all about. Um, tell me about the challenges of doing deals as an aggregator when you're already carrying a lot of linear channels. Tell me about how that plays out, that, that conversation. Well, that's getting harder and harder with OTT platforms popping up all the time. Um, I don't need to name them here, but they very often have a linear component as well. So we're already carrying, say, 10 linear channels from that group. Then they're launching an app, and they want an MG, and they want an MG over here, minimum guarantee. So you're kind of going, how many times do I have to pay for this content? Um, what's on the app? Oh, we're not sure yet. Okay, what's on the channel? Um, well, we think this is going to be on the channel. So it's very difficult to kind of keep up and to launch things. But at the same time, we can't be paying for things two, three, four, five times, especially in a sort of non-exclusive non environment. So that's one of the challenges. Um, and then the competition for sort of the UX and the UI that we have is intense. So when you do a Netflix deal, a Disney deal, or whoever it is, everybody wants to be on the front page. Everybody wants to be um, 
in front of the, the metadata landing page. Everybody wants their logo on the posters. So it's, it's kind of difficult to fit all, the, all these fantastic services that we want to show off about. We want to show the customer that we have them. But in terms of the challenge, it's a real headache sometimes to, to please everyone. How do you deal with those, or how do you manage those issues of prominence then? Is it, is it who pays the most gets the best position? Is it simply a negotiation? Other factors? Other factors, and this is something I learned when I joined Vodafone. In Germany, it's heavily regulated, right? So you can't just put somebody at the front because they pay the most. So there's a lot of regulation that plays into our biggest TV market. Um, and the others are just negotiations. You, you move things around. You take turns. You you know, depends on the content that they want to promote at any particular time, but it's it's a constant conversation. It never ends. You don't just sign the deal and walk away for three years, as, as we all know. Uh, and how important is it for you to, to offer, um, you know, a unified discovery experience across all of that content? It's everything. It's what makes it Vodafone TV, I think. Otherwise, you might as well be in a smart TV environment with all the logos and all the different, um, you know, ways of paying. The way that we do it is that you get one bill, you pay, you know, you know what you're paying, you have a customer service operation that is there for you, be that online or at the end of the phone. And I think that unified branding, it, it's what sets us apart. The search, for the search function, all of that, the, the kind of feeling that you are home and this is your TV service, and you know you can find the football there, you know you can find the movies there, the pay-per-view, whatever it might be. It's, it's familiarity, and I think having that branding I is, is everything. You've, as a company, made a pretty big tech decision to, to kind of roll out a new standardized platform based on Android. Um, is that super aggregation aspiration is that the central driving force behind that decision yeah for sure i think having an android platform is the one that enables you to do the most innovation to scale up it's the most choice of vendors in the set top box space and i'm told that that's where we get the most the most effective kind of chipset um, buying opportunities and so on. So for scale and innovation, absolutely, it's the right thing for us. And we need to unify our boxes. I think we've got about, I don't know how many iterations of boxes. So when you're having a Disney Plus conversation and you're saying, well, we've got about 30 boxes, and they're like, oh my God. So it'd be good to have, you know, one box, one size fits all. Let's and see. And is it about ease of aggregation of those apps as well? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a long queue. If you're doing a deal with Netflix or whoever it, whoever it is, um, they have their integration pressures and a finite number of engineers and software people who can do these things. And if you're saying that in some of our very small markets, we've got 50,000 of those boxes, they're saying, well, get to the back of the queue, right? So in terms of how we you know, interlock all of those pieces, um, having one box will make life so much easier. Uh, I mean, the main, or one of the main um, sensitivities around choice of Android by many larger operators has been, um, you know, a concern about having um, Google within your ecosystem. Is that something that Vodafone is not so concerned about? And we have fantastic relationships with Google anyway, right? Across, we, we do so much with them. And, and no, it doesn't worry us at all. I think in terms of ease of access to other services and linking with them, I, I don't think it's not a problem for us. When, when we talked about fast, you talked about new revenue opportunities there. What needs to be in place to actually seize those new opportunities? For example, do you, alongside this new deployment of Android, do you need to deploy a whole lot of new ad tech to make the most of that opportunity? Yeah, I think um, in an ideal world, whenever something launches, you want your platform to be super ready and super efficient. Um, and in an ideal world, yes, we'd have our own ad platform, but I think you need to prioritize you need to sort of get a sense of perspective and see what's important for your 
technical product colleagues to be doing, and you can't always get everything working perfectly from day day one. And in the fast space, um, we'll be looking at a plug and play to get us going. We just need to work with a really good aggregator who can help us, because you're not going to get everything done straight away, and then in parallel maybe build our own um, ad supported ad ad um, measurement tool or whatever it might be. But we're not we're not there yet. Is it is it fair to say though that you would have the um, well one of your objectives would be to take a slice of that ad revenue? Oh yeah, definitely. So so you need the <laughs> means to do that. Yeah, but you know with the the aggregators, I mean, there's some of them in the room, so I, I <laughs> they know who they are. You all know who they are, and their models are well known, right? It's it's RevShare. And obviously, if you're doing it yourself, your rev share can be better and, and all the rest of it. So um, absolutely, yeah, you've got to get something out of it, right? And I think ultimately, with the way that it's evolving, then it'll start to fund um, fund our sort of platforms quite differently. Yeah. So, you know, the pay TV, pay TV business has been around a long time. It really, you know, grew up on, you know, really driven by exclusivity especially sport, but also other content categories. You, you sort of hinted earlier in the conversation about, um, about you know, a, a world of non-exclusivity. Uh, would you say that that driving imperative to have exclusive content has, has gone away? It's um it's interesting because I come from kind of sports background and sports rights and a few years ago it absolutely has to be live exclusive it has to be the only place to get football and, and that's the end of it end of pay TV service mission accomplished but a lot has changed I think with the quality um, and, and the competition that is coming out now in in the general entertainment space and we um, in Spain we launched HBO Max exclusively. Um, two three years ago i think now and uh, it's been a that's the only market where we have exclusive content we tend not to do exclusive deals but the reason we did that was because we lost the football so you have to have or we thought you have to have something equally amazing to try and bridge that gap and we're constantly looking at exclusivity as does it make sense what have we learned from spain would we do it again so I think we're coming down on the side of, no, let's get everything in one place. Let's get as much as we can. Let's be that aggregator. Let's not necessarily chase that exclusivity. I'm not saying it's it's never going to happen, but for now, I think we're quite happy to just be that super aggregator and, and have everything at a reasonable price rather than, well, we all know um, what football um, rights fees can do to your platform. So... so I mean, I if you summarize that lesson from the Spanish experience, what would it be? Um, we're still learning. We're still looking at, um, you know, it's only been a couple of years, but it's it's not always a disaster just because you lose the sport. I mean, famous last words. <laughs> I mean, um, you look at other examples. You look at what's gone on in the Netherlands with, um, with Formula One and the Champions League and all the things that have changed there. And platforms are still doing really, really well, even without the exclusive platform the exclusive content uh, uh, sports. So it's not the only differentiator now. Do you think we're generally kind of moving into a world of more non-exclusivity then? For sure. I think so. And I think, um, you know, to Tim's point earlier, it's about creating those communities and that location, that place to view, that, you know, surfacing the content, finding the content, not paying too much for it, bundling it in with other services. I think that is, um, that's where we're headed, not necessarily down the road of the only place to get something. W when it comes, I mean, sport is obviously a kind of special category, but when it comes to other, other content categories, movies and TV, you know, big TV shows um, particularly, how do you see windowing evolving then around that idea? Well, I think it's interesting what's happening with um, some of the big studios in terms of going back to the cinema, not necessarily doing you know releases straight onto the television. We at home, um, there's a lot of movement. I think the pandemic changed things and maybe 
over change, if that's, if that's a real word, but in terms of, you know, taking away that cinematic experience, is that necessarily, would that work? Not sure. Um, so for us, it's, it's just trying to keep up. We're just trying to reflect what the industry is doing and it's, we'll do what they, they tell us to do. We need the content. So if they're saying this is going to be day and date, it's day and date. We're not going to change it, even though we're a huge operator, we're not going to change it for everyone. So I don't really have the answer. <laughs> This, this clock suddenly made a, made a big jump, so I, I, I thought we had quite a few minutes left for questions, but let's see if there are any questions. Right here. Any questions for Emma? Ben. Uh, hi, uh, Ben Woods at Media Research. I wanted to ask about um, discovery on the platform, which is really important, I imagine, as a super aggregator. Um, uh, people be able to find the content they want to watch. Is there any concern at all about the emergence of fast channels and just how many of these channels are coming online, that that could make that experience a little harder, almost overwhelm uh, viewers with content? Just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Oh, for sure, Ben. I think, um, you know, the more crowded the EPG gets, as I said, we would prefer to see fast channels in the EPG because you know people can have half a chance of finding them, whereas if they're in an app somewhere far away, uh, you'll never find them. So discoverability is is really important, but you know it's it's going to get very very crowded, and you're going to need to have super sophisticated um, search engines and all the rest of it to surface that content. Um, yeah, so it's going to be going to be tough, and it's. Um, you know, the EPG is nearly full, right? So <laughs> that's the other factor. You're up to four-figure EPGs now in some, some markets, which nobody likes. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the answer. Any more? Any Let's take one more question. Hi, Emma. My name's Oscar. I'm from uh, Nagra Kodelsky. Ah. And um, just an interesting observation with a question, if I may. I've noticed recently with immersive sporting experiences, particularly examples I've seen in NBA and Wimbledon, for example, and uh, some references to X Stadium in Meta's Oculus services, so the um, immersive sporting experiences offered by Meta. That at the moment is just US based, but what I'm interested in is um, immersive sporting experiences done well with the subscription service, the access to the content, the headsets, that's a great new format. Is that of interest? Have you looked at that? Yep. <laughs> yeah, we have a whole team in, uh, in Vodafone who look at innovation and VR and all the rest of it. And I think it's fantastic and it's something we have to do and it is something we are doing. So yeah, brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you, Emma. Big applause for Emma and Ben.